Hello, I'm going to describe some software I wrote called Machine Learning Explorer or MLX for short. This software is free. You can download it from my website. There's a link to the user's guide there as well. I recommend you read the user's guide before you install it on your machine to see if it will suit your purposes. This software runs under Windows. It should run under Linux as well. In order to run the software, you will have to first install Python 3 on your computer. The machine learning software deals only with what's called tabular data. This particular data set came from a website called Kaggle, which runs machine learning contests from time to time, and this is one. The data set is the Titanic Survival data set. This is a famous data set and projects in machine learning have been run against this data set many times. You can find some examples on the internet and in YouTube particularly. I will have a link to one of those at the bottom of this uh, YouTube video. I recommend that you look at that tutorial and thereby learn more about the data set and about machine learning in general. Here is a sample from that data set. This contains rows. Each row represents a passenger. The columns are what are called features. These features are variables uh, containing data about the passenger. For example, we have passenger ID. In the survived column, we have a 1 if the passenger survived, a 0 if the passenger perished. The idea in machine learning is to be able to learn from this data set in such a way that we can predict the target column which is survived from the rest of the data about the passenger. So we are going to try and construct a program that can take a data set like this in and accurately predict whether or not the passenger survived. When you start this software, MLX, you are presented with the setup page which is to the left here. In the setup page you have to pick a name for your project. In this case I've called it UT. You can put any kind of a description you wish. You have to specify a project folder that the software will use to store its data sets. You can pick a random state. I suggest you leave it here at 442. You click on the button make new project and a new project is set up. The next thing you have to do is name what's called a data object. I've called that data object SV here. And then you find the file on your computer. In this case, it's the Titanic uh, demo file. Once you click make a new data object, it will show you the parameters required to read in this data set. These parameters uh, can be left alone. The defaults will work just fine. If you have to change them, all you have to do is click on one of the values here and change it to the value you like. Throughout this software, you will see these so-called parameter boxes where you can change the parameters. There's also a help button specified, and if you look at that help button, it will bring up on your browser information about that particular function that the parameters are for. In this case, it's a read CSV that stands for read comma separated variable file in the library is pandas. So you can read all about what these parameters do and more about what this particular function does just by clicking on this help button. The other thing that you have to do in the setup file is you have to specify a date format. There are no dates in this data, so this is not important in this example. The other thing you have to do is specify the target column. This is what the prediction software is going to try and calculate after it's learned from the data. Throughout this software you'll see a column menu button. Uh, an example is this. When you click on that, it will list for you all of the columns in the data set. We saw that before. Here they all are and they are the same as the column names in the data set. So after you pick the target column 
you've made a new data object and you're ready to proceed, the next step in the process of machine learning is to actually split this data, this data that we set up and called SV. To split the data, we proceed to the split page, which looks like this. The reason for splitting the data is so that we have a separate data set to train the software with and another data set that we'll use to actually see how well the software, the software does the prediction task that it's designed to do. Once again, if you click the help button here, you will see the meaning of these parameters and I'll skip over that analysis right now. Suffice it to say that when you split the data, it will result in either two or three more data sets. You must have a training data set. This is saying 80% of this data set will be dedicated to a training data set. If you left this to be zero, the remaining 20% would be the test data set. You must have a training data set and a test data set. If you were to make this, say, 10% of the data, then the remaining 10% would be used for what's called a validation set. After you do that, you click the Save Split button and it will split the data. This will show you the data sets that now are owned by this project. We have SV, which is the original one. We have a test, train, and validation data set. And there are 891 rows originally. 90 of those rows are in the test data set, 712 in the train data set, and about 90 in the validation data set. And I'll show you how these data sets are used in a second. All of these data sets are on disk, and they're placed in the folder that you designated when we did the setup page. After you've acquired the data and split the data, the next step in a machine learning project is to look at the data. We can look at the data statistically and with plots. We'll start with the statistical views of the data. We're going to be looking at the training data. If you look at the top here, always shown at the top is the current project, which is UT, the current data set, which is called the training data set, and it's named after SV, which was the primary data set. This is the data set that backs it up, sv.train.csv, and we'll get to the preprocessor after we look at the data, and that, that will be applied to clean up the data. Here is the statistics page. Now there are a number of statistical functions you can choose and here they all are. I'm going to pick the mean function and you can pick the columns that you wish to invoke the, this statistic on and I'm going to pick our target variable called survived. If I do this, you'll see that the mean for survival is about 38 or 38 percent of the people survived which means 62 percent of the people perished. If you think about it the survived variable is a zero or one if you added them all up and divided by the number of passengers that would give you the percentage of people who survived which is a small number 38 percent. The purpose in looking at the data is to get some insight into what the data means. Some of that is to find out how the data needs to be cleaned up. We'll see that there are outliers, there's missing data, there's badly coded data. All of that has to be cleaned up before we can make a model that can do the prediction that we're asking it to do. I recommend that you start by looking at three of these functions. The first one is the head. The only parameter is the number of rows that to look at, so we'll look at, say, 45, and 
we'll pick the head function and we'll eliminate the columns. If you don't put any columns in here, it looks at all the columns. And so here's the head of our data set, which is sitting at 5. If we change this to 15, as I originally intended to do, or say 45, say, and do the statistics, now we have 45 rows displayed. And so you do this first, if you didn't otherwise have a way to look at the data, this is what you do first, just to get an idea of what the rows and the columns look like. And we've seen this before. The next function I recommend that you look at is describe. This will look at all the numeric columns. And here we see all of those. And it gives you the count, which is the number of rows. Some of the counts are less than 712, for example, age. That means that there's some missing data. So we don't have all of the ages for all of the rows. Some of, some of it is missing. We get the mean. Uh, here's our mean again, 38%. Uh, standard deviation, minimum, and a maximum. Now if you go over here to age, you'll see that we have a maximum age of 300. This is a pretty good way to find outliers. Clearly, nobody is age 300. So this is a piece of data that we're going to have to correct. And we found it by looking at this describe function. The next page that I, or the next uh, statistic that I recommend you look at is info, which is this. Again, we'll let the columns uh, default to all of the columns and that information looks like this. Here we have a better count of missing data. We see that age is missing 144 values. The cabin is missing 546 values. We have the number of uh, values for embarked, which is two. We have the number of unique values, so we have out of 712 rows, we have 712 unique passenger IDs, which is what you'd expect. We have some names are repeated, apparently, and we can get other information by looking at this info uh, statistic. Another thing you can do in the statistics is to subset the data that the statistic is looking at. If I pick mean again, and let's say I pick um, survived, and now I say I want to look at that statistic by sex. Okay, so now if I do these statistics, I see that for sex we've got 75% of the females survived, 18% of the males did not survive. So that's pretty interesting, even though the overall survival rate was only 32%, um, we can see that many more women and girls survived than males did. We also note that we've got a question mark for sex and we've got a male, capital M-A-L-E. This is clearly miscoded, so again we have an indication that we have to clean up the sex variable at least to fix these two, va these two values. That's an illustration of how you might use this by uh, selection. You can also put multiple columns in here and get um, data by, by, by say sex and by age, for example. If you wanted to pick age, you could do that. Okay, um, the other thing you can do is you can subset it by putting in a Boolean value. For example, I can look at the average of the survived column, and I can look at that just for people of, say, age less than 30, let's say. So this is going to give me the average of the survived column but just for people whose age is less than 30. And so we see that 41% of the people 
under 30 survived, which is a better survival rate than the overall survival rate. So you can continue to play with this statistics page. Uh, I'll do one more because it uh, can be very useful. If we pick the correlation, uh, which is here, and we ask for all variables, we can get some indication as to what variables are most likely to be predictive of survived. So if we were look, to look at the uh, survived column and how the uh, various uh, variables correlate to that column, we might get an idea as to what is a good predictor and what isn't. The other way we can look at the data is with a plot or plots. So here's that page. We can have a lot of different plots. Here they all are. Uh, we could start off with a histogram plot and we could plot uh, the age as a histogram. There are all sorts of parameters you can fill in for the plot. This, is use, this uses a library called Seaborn and again if you click on the help button you'll see more about that. So let's do the histogram plot for age. And it looks like this and you'll see here's our outlier of 300 so that is another way to find outliers. We can also subset this and we can just say I'm interested in the people uh, age less than 50 say and now when we do the histogram plot for age we get that. So you can see it's fairly well distributed. We have a lot of very young babies and not so many people under the age of 15 and so forth. I'll do one more plot. Uh, let's do a scatter plot. And this it wants uh, two variables. Here's our scatter plot. So we could do age versus, uh, oh, we could do age versus fair. I don't know that that would mean anything. And let's do it for ages less than 90 to get rid of our 300. And here's what that plot looks like. And so here we have age along the bottom and we have how much they paid for their ticket uh, uh, as the Y column. And you can see that some tickets were very expensive, much more expensive than the others. And it seems like people who are, you know, in their 20s and 30s paid a fair amount. Uh, maybe these older people uh, didn't pay nearly as much and so forth. Okay, normally you would spend much more time looking at the data in all sorts of ways before you went on, but I'm going to go on and talk next about a very important function in machine learning called pre-processing. After we've examined the data in a machine learning project, the next step is to clean that data. That step is called pre-processing. Some of the things we do in pre-processing is to correct obvious mistakes. You remember that we had mail coded as in capital letters when it should have been coded in lowercase letters that we can easily understand how to fix. There's some data that we won't know how to fix. For example, we had an age of uh, 300 and we don't know what that true age should be so we're going to mark data like that as missing and then when we've done everything we can in those two areas we're going to replace all the missing data with some reasonable value. Another, th another thing we can do is to scale the numeric columns. You will remember from uh, statistics it's a thing called a z-score where you can uh, center the data around the average and divide by the standard deviation and that gives you data that's more or less in the same range and that's a pretty good way of getting rid of outliers. And the other thing that we might want to do is to add new features. Uh, that's to add new columns to our data set with the idea that maybe we can help these uh, subsequent models along by giving them more information to work with. Here is the pre-processing page in our software. Every preprocessor has to have a name. I've called this PP1 
once you give it a name you click on make new preprocessor and it will do that for you a preprocessor consists of a number of steps each step has a sequence number I've already created a bunch of steps here and here they all are you can see that I've left gaps in the sequence numbers so that if I had to I could insert an another step between two existing steps and now we'll look at some of these preprocessing steps the first one is force type what this does is it takes the columns that I know to be categorical data that is to say they are just labels as opposed to uh, numeric numeric data that that is they're neither counts nor measurements but labels and I'm marking these columns with the category of true and then none of them are date nor numeric so I add the step and that becomes step 100 the next step that I've set here is a replace value remember uh, capitalized mail was wrong it should be lowercase mail so what this does is for this particular column it replaces uppercase mail with lowercase mail another step this is valid between remember we had an age that was 300 that was incorrect we don't know what it should be but what we probably can say is that an age should be between 0 and 100 any age outside of this range will be marked as missing it will not be discarded but it will be marked as missing next step we don't know anything except the training data we don't know what the test data is going to look like we don't know what any future data will look like so it's a good idea to correct data that we haven't seen and one way to do that is to say as far as the sex column is concerned the only valid values are male and female if it encounters a value not one of those two it will mark that data that one uh, entry in the uh, car in the uh, table that one entry would be marked as missing the next step is to fill the missing data so for age we're going to fill the missing data with a median age we could use the average we could use the maximum or the minimum or we could fill in a specific value if that were appropriate but in this case we're going to take any missing value for age and replace it with a median value for all the ages in that column in this case for embarked and for sex these are two categorical columns again and we're going to pick the method uh, called mode which is the most common uh, value so in the case of sex I believe the most common value was male and so any missing value for sex will be marked as male the other thing we have to do uh, some modeling is going to require that the categorical data be translated from character to integer and even integer data that's categorical uh, has to be recoded as values between 0 and n minus 1 P class had been coded as 1 2 and 3 we're now going to code that as 0 1 and 2 and the reason to do that you'll see later get dummies uh, anytime we have categorical data rather than one column with n values we're going to turn that into n columns and each of those columns will either be a zero or a one in fact all of them except for one column will be a zero and the one column that represents that value will be coded as a one let me see if I can give you a more concrete example so that uh, you can see what's going on here's a simple example suppose in our table we had a column called color and we had three different colors red green and blue coded as you see here we're going to take the this color value and we're, we're going to add three columns to our table here they are one's going to be red green and blue and they're going to be coded as follows when the true color is red it'll be coded as 100 for green it'll be coded as 010 
and for blue it'll be coded as 001. Here's another occurrence of blue. What this does, it lets the model understand these things not as numbers or as text, but as something it can deal with. Uh, and this greatly aids the, many, many models are greatly aided by this technique. And this is called Get Dummies in the nomenclature of the software we're using. So that's what sequence 800 is doing for these two uh, categorical variables. In this step we're adding a column. Now it turns out that two columns in the original data, is, one is called PARCH, which stands for parents and children. So for an, any given passenger, this is the sum of the parents and children on board of that passenger. And this uh, column, SIPSB, stands for the number of siblings plus the number of spouses that that person has on board. So rather than ha using these columns separately, I'm going to come up with a new column. I'm going to call that family, and that's just the sum total of the family members that that person has on board. The idea being that maybe our modeling will be helped by looking at the total sum rather than looking at each piece of the number of families. That may or may not be useful. All we can do is try it and see. The last uh, function I have here is uh, to scale the data. We have age, which is an integer ranging from, say, 0 to 100 in fair, which we saw I think goes all the way to 500 pounds and uh, can be uh, much less than that. And so to make these columns more equal in terms of the magnitude of the numbers, we can scale them. And to reduce the range of numbers in each column, we can uh, scale them. Uh, the scaling does that as well. So that's also very useful for most models to scale the numeric columns. Now those are just some of the functions that are available to you uh, in pre-processing. There's a whole bunch of them and uh, you can read more about these in the user's guide. And again, the help button will also give you information about any particular uh, uh, function. Now after we've got all of our steps set up, when you add a step it doesn't actually do anything to the data, it just makes this sequence of steps. And so the next thing you have to do is to fit and transform. Again, remember we're working with the training data. It's important to remember that the fitting of the preprocessor goes against the training data. You'll see when we get to modeling, it's the same sort of a thing. We fit or train the model against the training data, not the other data sets. Once we have the, the preprocessor fitted against the training data, we can apply it to other data sets, like the test data set and the other uh, data set that we may be using. So to do that, you click on this button. You can see here it says, well, I'd already fitted it, so I'm going to unfit it, which is what this reverse button does. After you fit and transform it, you may have made a mistake, and you may have to go back and change your preprocessor. So to do that, you click this button. What that does is it goes out to the disk and reloads the data set. So in this case, it's going to reload the training data. So any changes that we had made by this fit transform button is now wiped out because we have a fresh copy of the original data set back into memory. Now when we do the fit transform, it will fit the preprocessor and then it will transform the data. It's really two steps combined into one. You can see now that it says that the preprocessor one has not been fitted, but as soon as we click on this, it says it's been fitted to this data set, the training data set, and it was applied to the training data set. Eventually we're going to come to some data sets like the test data set where we're going to want to transform the test data set. We're going to click this button. We're not, it's already been fitted against training data. We transform it against the validation set and the, training, and the test set by clicking the transform button. At any time we can uh, revert it and we can also undo the transform if we feel like we have to go all the way back to the preprocessor refit and transform against the uh, training data set and then tr then we can transform again uh, uh, the training data set or whatever other data set we we did the untransform on. 
So that's a brief overview of how pre-processing works. I should say that pre-processing can take up more than 50% of your time in any machine learning project. It's tedious and can be error prone and does require a good deal of trial and error to get it right. Before we go on, we can look at our report again. And now we see that we've got a preprocessor, it's been fitted to the training data set, and it's been applied to the training data set. So that's the progress that we've made during this step. Now we go to the heart of the problem, and that is to come up with a model that can accurately predict our target column. The modeling page looks like this. There are two kinds of models, one for regression problems and one for classification problems. This project that we're working on is a classification problem because we're trying to find a label for each passenger, that label being a zero or a one, meaning the passenger either perished or survived. So we name our model and then we pick a learner from the classification set of possible learners. These are the algorithms that actually do the uh, understanding, the learning, as well as the prediction. The first one I picked was uh, XGB classifier. And then you click on make a new model, it makes the model. There's some parameters. Again, you can click the help button to figure out what these parameters do. Our target column was set uh, back in the setup page and now we have to pick the independent variables or the X columns. These are the columns that we're going to use to predict the target column. We could pick any columns we want, but it's advisable to pick the ones that really matter, the ones that are going to be helpful. If you put in everything, that's just going to add noise to the model and make it harder for the model to uh, do the prediction. So after we do this, we fit and train the model. Again, we're working with a training data set. So to fit and train the model is to uh, fit it against the training data set. And we click on this and we see that it's fitted. Now, sometimes there's in interesting information that you can get uh, after it's been fitted. And here's some of that. And this won't make any sense to you, but in order to actually fit the model, it has to gather some data across all of the training set, and it sort of summarizes all that data and uses that as further information in helping it predict the target column when it comes to do the prediction. So after we've fitted it, then we, we have to pick a scoring method. This scoring method should be used throughout, throughout the whole project. Don't switch the scoring methods or you won't be able to compare one model to the other. Here we picked accuracy. We could have picked the AOC score, which I won't explain, but the accuracy score is very easy to understand. That's just the number that the model got right divided by the total number it tried to predict. So if, it, if we had 800 rows in our training data set and it got 400 of those rows correct and 400 incorrect, it would be 400 over 800 or 50% accuracy. So after we've done all that, we can do the prediction. And here's the prediction. And for this particular model, with these, with this learner and these uh, parameters set and these independent variables, x values, it came up with a accuracy, an accuracy of about 85%. That's not too bad. It's not real great, but it's not too bad either. So. You do this and you pick a bunch of models and proceed in the same way. So we've got uh, this model, which we can fit, and then we can score by doing the prediction. This comes up with 0.841. Again, this is all against the training data. And you should understand that a model doing well against the training data is not terribly surprising because it was trained on that data. It's going to be more interesting to see how well it does against data it's never seen before. 
So I've got uh, this Ada Boost classifier. Uh, I've got another version of that, and all I did was increase the number of estimators. Again, we fit the model, we do the prediction. This comes up with this uh, score, 84% accuracy. Uh, another model, this is a base model. Uh, the base model for a classifier just takes the most common occurrence in the target column and it attributes that common occurrence to everything. It makes a prediction, in this case it's going to make a prediction that everybody perished or had a value of zero because that was the most common value and so we fit this and we do the prediction and we see that's pretty low. It's only 62 percent which tallies with what we found when we were looking at the data that 62 percent of the people perished and something uh, like a 38% of the people survived. Another model that we made is a neural net model. This is uh, more complicated and I won't explain everything there is to explain about a neural net but basically there's an error function that measures how far the model is from uh, making good predictions and uh, you get to pick the function for that. For a classifier, there's only one function that really makes sense, and that's this thing. There's an optimizer. This thing is trying to push this error uh, down to zero. This is called a loss, and it's trying to push that down to zero. It does this by means of this optimizer. In this case, it's stochastic gradient descent. There's only really two that you can pick for that, and, that, and this is by far the most common. There's other parameters that you have to pick. The learning rate is very important. That determines how fast uh, the neural net converges. If it converges too fast, it jumps around and doesn't settle down too well. If it's too slow, it'll take too long to um, converge. And there's uh, other things like the batch size. The, the whole training set is divided up into batches, and these batches are run through multiple times and every time a whole training set is done it's called an epic and we decided to run through the training set 500 times with a batch size of 30. In addition now each neural net has got layers okay and there are different kinds of layers and I won't go into this but here are the common types of layers that I've decided to set up for this particular neural net but there are other kinds of layers and you can see the kinds of layers here there are batch normal dropout and linear layers and then there's things called an activation layer and you can pick functions for that. And each layer in the neural net has got a number of nodes and you can pick that for most layers. And uh, there's one more thing, it's called an embedding and you can take the categorical columns and instead of using that get dummies thing that I talked about, which is what most modeling would require, uh, neural nets like something called an embedding. You'll have to look that up to find out uh, how that works, but it's a very clever way of helping the neural net uh, do uh, really good uh, work with uh, categorical variables. So we have all these layers and we have all these parameters and we do the same thing. We fit the model. Now fitting a neural net takes some time. I'm going to start it off and you can see that it takes a while to start up that once it starts it tells you what the loss is and you can see the loss start to decrease every and this is reporting out every 10 epochs what the loss is and you'd like to see this decreasing and not jumping around too much I'm going to stop the video now and let this run and then I'll come back when it's done now I'm going to stop the training of the neural net it's only done 220 epochs 220 runs through all of the training data. You can stop the neural net and it will show you a graph of how the loss has progressed. Uh, if I'd let it run longer this would have been a better story but as you can see the loss is bouncing around and this thing is not really convert, convert, converging. So you need to all alter the parameters, maybe have some more layers in the neural net, just play around with this. It's um, take some time to do but you can see uh, what's going on uh, by looking at this graph and by watching the uh, loss progress. Now once it's uh, done training you can click on the predict button and it's 0.823 about 82 percent accurate. Not bad, pretty much like the other ones uh, did. 
Now, before we leave this particular training uh, set for these models, I point out one more thing. You can learn more about how good the prediction was by clicking this button. And for uh, classification, there's two kinds of reports. Um, there's a classification report which shows you the recall and the precision uh, and as well as the accuracy. You can look up what these things mean uh, in uh, any, any source that explains uh, classification uh, problems. Uh, there's another report you can get out. It's maybe a little bit clearer. This is called a confusion matrix and it shows you uh, for the labels that it predicted zero, how many did it get right and how many did it get wrong? The, the, uh, the bottom is what it predicted. The, uh, the y-axis is the true label. So when it predicted zero and it really was zero, it got 373 right. But when it predicted zero and the real value was one, it got 58 wrong. Okay, so you can see this, and this is very informative and useful for people who are concerned about uh, false positives and false negatives and try to minimize one or the other. Now if we look at our report again, we see that we've got some models. Here they are. We see that they've been fitted to the training data set and we have a score against the training data set. And here are all the scores. You can see that the winner here is the XGB classifier. Slightly better than some of these other ones. Again, as I said before, just because a model does well on the training set does not mean it is going to do well on data it's never seen before. So that's the next step. We're going to look at these models and see how they do against the validation uh, data set. To do that, you have to go back to the setup page and now you pick the validation data set and then you go to the preprocessor. Remember the preprocessor has been trained but it's trained against the training data set and we've just loaded into memory a new data set. So we've not applied the preprocessor to this new data set, the validation data set. So to do that we click the transform button and now we see that it's been applied to the validation data set. And now we go back to the modeling page and we go to all of our models and now it's been fitted so we don't have to do that again. But what we have to do is score it against the validation set and look at what those scores are like. So our first model we uh, predict, uh, predict and that's the value we get. Let's go to the next model and predict that model and see how it does against the validation data set and that's its score and our base model which won't change at all in all likelihood and it did it went down a little bit for some reason uh, I should say that we don't really have enough data to make a good validation data set and so uh, this is a little bit off uh, you really need more data than I've got here for a validation data set. Here's our neural net. Now our neural net doesn't take long to do the prediction. It's already been fitted against the training data set. Here's this prediction and it's not bad at all. 0.85. Okay, and our last model is XGB which was our winner against the training data set, against the validation data set. It looks like about uh, not quite as good as it did before. Now, if we look at the report, the last thing we have to do here is see how the one model that we're going to pick performs against the test, the test data set. The idea is we're going to pick our best model here, which looks like our XGB classifier. No, it doesn't. It looks like our neural net classifier against the validation data set is the best one. So our order has changed here. Uh, on the validation data set. And you pick the best model, which is our neural net classifier, and we're going to see how that does against the test data set, and that will be the final scoring for the final model that we are going to select. We're going to select the neural net classifier. So, to get the test data set, we again, we go back to setup, 
we go pick the test data set we have to go to the pre-processing page and apply our preprocessor against the test data which is done now and now we can go back to the modeling page we're going to pick our favorite model which is our neural net model and we're going to see how it well it does against the test data set and it comes up with 0.74 not as well well let's see actually that's, that's a, not bad at all here's our report our report says against our test data set it's uh, 0.74 not great not nearly as great as it was uh, against the validation set but this is the this is the true value that we should use if we had to answer the question just exactly how good is this model we'd have to answer it's about its accuracy is roughly 74 percent okay in a nutshell that's all I have to say about this software and about uh, machine learning again I recommend that you go to uh, a tutorial on machine learning for uh, the Titanic data set on YouTube I'll include a link read uh, follow that through see how it compares with this software the software is still under development uh, if you check my website from time to time you may see a new version crop up uh, that would be mainly bug fixes and occasionally maybe a new feature if you find any bugs please email me with as much data as you can screenshots would be very helpful uh, so good luck with the software it's completely free it's forever free there are no advertisements uh, if you want to uninstall the data uh, the um, the software all you have to do is delete the folder that you unzipped uh, the software into that doesn't alter your registry or anything like that thank you for your attention